When you become a father, you're a father forever. But the time with your kids goes just like that. Um, it's very quick. Uh, it's hard to believe. When, when I was um, first in the ministry and first became a dad, uh, Taylor was two, and I would hear people say that. It goes quick. It goes just like that. And I was like, uh, you're not living my life. You're not doing the things that I'm doing. It's going to take forever. I mean, it's one of those. And then all of a sudden, blink, and it's gone. Um, you know, this is a very different stage uh, to be in where, where I am now, standing here um, several years later, 20 years later, after having my first child, and having a 20-year-old, having an adult uh, child, and, and, and seeing her becoming involved in ministry and, and, and doing those things, and still having one in the house that, uh, that we're still trying to figure out, a little complicated uh, sometimes, but... Uh, you know, it, it's an exciting thing. When, when, when Josh sent this to me to uh, review for this morning, I, I watched it and thought, wow, you know, you can just pretty much build on that. We've been in a series uh, on fear, uh, but we're going to take a break uh, from that today just to, uh, to celebrate uh, what today is, and it's Father's Day. And we want to celebrate you guys that are, that are here, that, uh, that serve in that role. Uh, some of you guys are here that have had dads that have gone on to be with the Lord, and this kind of a tough day for you. Uh, you have family members that this is a tough day, and, and so there's a, it, it, it approaches us all a little bit different. And if you're like me, when you watch that, it, it kind of grabs you a little bit, and, and uh, you know there's no way that you can uh, watch something like that because all of us have dads, and all of us, whether they're here with us or whether they've gone on or, or, or whatever the case may be, uh, we all have those memories. And I've been, been kind of cruising through Facebook yesterday and, and looking at the, at the things that you guys put on and, and, and how you celebrate your dads. And some of you choose not to do that. That's cool. And that's okay, too. But uh, the things that you do to, to, uh, just to pay tribute uh, to the fathers in, in our lives. And for some of us, we have dads. Uh, we have father figures. Uh, maybe for some of you, you didn't have the, the father or the dad at home that you wanted to have, but there was somebody in your life that was that father figure, was that person that uh, that you really could lean on, that you could really trust, and, and that you could really connect with. And, and so we want to celebrate them today. I, I want to point us uh, to a passage of, of Scripture. It, it's the very beginning of Psalms, and, and we want to kind of build on that today. It's Psalm 1. Uh, looking at uh, what God uh, shares with us and, and, and how to be the kind of father that we should be uh, looking, at, uh, looking at this instruction uh, that we have. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We're going to talk about two ways this morning. Uh, that's what this kind of lays out for us, uh, that we have two ways that we can choose to go, two, way, two ways that we can choose to live our lives, two ways that we can decide uh, to take. And what we realize is that life is about choices, isn't it? We all have choices that we make every day. Uh, every day that we get up, we have a, a multitude of choices. There may be very big choices. They may be very small choices. But every choice comes with a result. Every choice that we make comes with a result. Every choice has a consequence. Uh, every choice has a consequence. And it can be a good consequence. It can be bad consequences. But every choice has a result, has a consequence to it. And here's the thing about God. God made you. If somebody has never reminded you of that or told you that or reinforced that, let me do that this morning. Let me help you understand that, that you are a child of God. He created you and made you wonderful. And, and He loves you just the way that you are. But He gave you the opportunity to choose. He gave you free will. And he gave, you, he gave you the opportunity to make uh, all kinds of choices. He gave you the opportunity to choose him, or he gave you the opportunity to not choose him. 
But what I want to share with you this morning is as you live your life and as uh, some of you that are in that, uh, in that parenting role, as you live your life, you make those decisions on whether you're going to choose his way or the other way, uh, what the consequences are to that. And let me encourage you uh, in, uh, in, in making uh, the right choice. You see, the problem that we have with consequences uh, is that uh, we, we want choice, but we really don't want the consequence. Uh, that's the kind of the way society teaches us. Uh, we don't really think about the consequences so many times. We make choices and then we want to live the way we want to live. And, and, and so we have these kinds of things that come in. We, we eat too much, but we don't want the consequences of that, you see. Uh, we want to eat what we want to eat when we want to eat it, and we just don't want any consequences of that. Uh, we want to be lazy. You know, that's just kind of a little human tendency to kind of want to sit down, but, but we don't want to be broke. Uh, we, 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 want, we want to spend more than we have. That's kind of natural. But we look around, we see things, we want things, we want to do things. We want to spend more than we have, but we don't want the responsibility of the debt that we create. And here's the thing. Sin is enticing. Sin entices us. If you go all the way back to the original sin, if you all, go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, you realize that Satan was there with Eve and he was enticing her. Okay? He was enticing her with the fruit. And she looked at the fruit and saw that it was enticing. It was good. It would taste good. You see, here's the thing about sin. If sin is not fun, then you're not doing it right. <laughs> All right? Okay, that's just, that's just the fact of life. Okay, if, if sin is not fun, then you've done something, you're messing it up because, it, because it, it feels good. All right, that's just the way it is. It feels good and it draws us in. It entices us. Okay, it entices us. That's the way Satan works. He doesn't, he doesn't show you the consequences and say, here, we want you to do this so that you'll be uh, in, in, in rehab or we want you to do this so that you'll be in terrible health or we want you to do this so that you'll, you know, all these things. He doesn't show you the results of the sin. He shows you the fun that you're going to have. And so sin entices us and draws us to make those bad choices. And when we, we make bad choices, we deal with bad consequences. Well, where does that fit in parenting? <laughs> where does that fit with Father's Day? You know, when Taylor was coming, before she was born, she was our first, so that's when I became a father. When she was on the way, um, you go through a lot of emotions, and I was pretty young at the time and just out of college and had been teaching uh, three years. Um, and so I was still young and, and still wanting to do a lot of things. And, and I remember, kind of like he uh, said here in, in the video, what's it like to be a dad? I had a dad, I had a papa, and I had all these people in my life, but I didn't know what it felt like to be on the other other side of that. So when, when I was going through that, uh, when, when Sandy was going through all the sickness and all the things, uh, I was going through that process of what's this going to be? What's it going to be like? And you know, you really, it really doesn't hit you in the first six months, but it's that last trimester, it's that last three months when the countdown begins and it's almost time. And, and for us, it was right after Christmas and Taylor was born in March. So we're counting it down January, February, and all of a sudden winter is over and now it's spring and, and we're going to these classes and we're doing all this stuff. And all of a sudden it becomes real to me that this child is about to be born. And it's like, wow. And, and, and it, just, it just hit me. And it's like, what's this going to be like? You know, all of a sudden, I'm going to have this, 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 this child, this person that God is going to entrust me with and I'm going to be responsible for. And so there's just a wave of emotions. And, and when she was born, I remember, you know, you just fall in love instantly. And, and you just, I remember the first day in the hospital and I remember being there in the, in, in the rocking chair. And I rocked her and she, she was only five pounds and, and 12 ounces uh, and she fit between my wrist and my elbow. Okay, that's how long she was when she was kind of curled up. She was just little bitty, tiny, tiny. And I remember just holding her and thinking, wow, wow, wow. But then you go home and you have, all, so it's, I tell these people all the time, the first three days of, of, of being a parent is really the easiest because you're like, oh, it's all brand new. But I mean, you've got a whole staff of people that are professionals and they're in the hospital and they've got all this stuff and they've got all these books and they've got all these things and they can just come and do everything. And then all of a sudden it's like, see ya. And, and you go home, and then you're home, and it's like, oh my gosh, and now we have this child at home. And, and so then all the things and all the reality 
begins to set in. And, and what happens, and what happened to me, and this was, an, this was an experience that I had to deal with. I don't talk about it a lot, but I wanted to share some of it with you this morning because for me, the reality of what it takes to be a parent began to set in. And, and, and for me, there was, there was two things that really hit me. Number one was time, and number two was financial. You begin to realize just how much money it takes to raise a baby. It's like, oh my gosh, formula is expensive, and diapers are expensive. And all of these things, and, and it just kind of hits you, and it's like, wow, you know, we don't have enough money to, to be able to go and do anything. And, and, then, and then it's like, well, every time we want to go somewhere, it's like, wow, it takes so much to travel this child because we have to have car seats, and we have to have all these things, and we don't have vehicles big enough. And, 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 and so all of these realities. And, and then what happens is, is then, this is when Satan comes. This is when Satan comes, and he begins to entice you, Okay. He begins to entice you and he begins to say, look, look at the things that you're giving up. Look at the things that you're giving. You remember the boat that you wanted? You remember the fishing pole that you were planning on getting? You remember the gun that you wanted? You remember the this that you were going to do? And, and, and so all of a sudden you start, you start looking and it's like all the time that it takes. And, you know, and, and what I would give now to go back and have another day of rocking and reading. You know, but, but when you're doing those things, you're looking at your watch and you're thinking, well, this is deer season's coming in, turkey season's coming in, and I got all this going on. And, and, and so what happens is there's those feelings inside of us in those early days of being a father that's selfish. Okay, and I hear this from young dads sometimes too. I need some me time and I need these kinds of... And, and so you get, this, you get this selfishness that comes in. And what that is, is that Satan beckoning to you to take time away from your kids. Okay, now you gotta have some you gotta have some God time, you gotta have some things, you gotta, don't don't get me wrong. But but what happens is is you begin to get into this competition between the role of being a parent and the other way. This morning what I wanna spell out for you and what I wanna help you to do is the decision that I eventually made and, and when Taylor was two years old Sandy and I were struggling and struggling being new parents, struggling in our marriage and struggling in a lot of things. And, and it kind of came to a crossroads and come to a place where it's like, I got to make a decision if I'm going to choose this way or that way. And I had to make the choice. And shortly thereafter, making my decision, I became a pastor, surrendered to the Lord. And here I am now, 18 years later. But to get to that point, there's things that we had to do to make those things happen. And, and, and this is what I want you to ponder. Those of you that are thinking about uh, uh, going down this road, some of you guys may be new dads, some of you may have uh, sons that are going to be dads eventually, I want you to think about some of these things that we're going to share with you today and, and where we go. And, and, and these are things that I think that a father should be. And, and I, I pulled these things, kind of lifted these things from the, from the first psalm. And the first is a man of character. You know, God gives us the law to live by. He tells us how we should live our lives. And he, and he, and he has things in that law that, that, that sometimes when we listen to Satan, when we listen to that side, it's like, well, you don't want me to have any fun. <laughs> listen, he knows the consequences of the decisions that we make. So when we read something and it says, you know, I, I really shouldn't be going there. I really shouldn't be saying that. I really shouldn't be drinking that. I really shouldn't be doing that. It's not because he doesn't want you to have any fun. It's because he wants you to be a man of the law. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be there for your kids. You see, because he knows the consequences when we make those choices and we make those decisions. And what did Jesus say that we should do above all things? When we talk about the law, what's, what did Jesus say was the greatest commandment? What does he command us more than anything else? So love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. That's the kind of man that we need to be. Our kids need to see us loving him. Our kids need to see us loving our neighbors. That's the kind of men of character that we need to be. Number two, we should be men of integrity. Not changing or shifting moral principles. We need to stand for something. Okay? We need to stand for something. We live in a, in, a, in, a, in a world that wants to tell you that one minute you're this and the next minute you can be that and everything just changes and nobody wants any moral absolutes. <laughs> I got news for you. 
God has moral absolutes. All right? And we need to be men of integrity. Okay? We need to be men of integrity. And here, here's something else. Okay? And we put this out on YouTube, but I don't care. If he made you a man, you're a man. Okay? If he made you a man, be a man. And be the father that he called you to be. And be a man of integrity. Okay? Be a man of integrity. Things uh, will begin to emerge when we start going off the, the chart of moral absolutes. And, and, and one thing uh, will come to another and all of a sudden what, what we have is moral chaos. You have to have a measure by which you gauge moral integrity. And guys, this is that, that measure. The third thing is we should be men of example. We should be men of example. We need to live a Christian walk and we need to be an example. The example that we follow in that should be Christ. But we need to find Christian men, and this church has a lot of them. We need to find men that are, that are doing this. We need to find men that are being the example that we need to be. And, and young guys, you need to find those guys and you need to model after them. You, you, need, to, you need to look at what they're doing because sometimes you know, it's hard to read all this and figure it all out and understand it all. But look and see what they're doing. Look at their kids. Look at their family. You know, that's the greatest compliment that, that, that anybody can give to me as a parent is to look at my kids and say, wow, I'm proud of my kids. I'm proud of my girls. You know, it seems like yesterday that we were just, you know, in diapers and running around. And, and now we're, we're growing and we're developing. And, 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 and God gives us, uh, he gives us children and he, he makes them all different. And for Taylor uh, this week, uh, it was one of those things that uh, she, uh, she's at camp this summer. She's working at Camp Joy. And it was a big decision for her. You know, there was times that she didn't really want to go very far away from home and stay anywhere. So leaving, going to college, that was a rough day. But, but when she made the decision to accept the call to come to Camp Joy and be uh, uh, on staff there, uh, that was hard. And, and, and so for the first two weeks there, it was basically picking up sticks and cleaning. And, and we're not talking just a little bit. We're talking, you know, from daylight till midnight, uh, two weeks of just, you know, intense work. And she's texting me going, I didn't sign up for this. And how much more do I take before I quit? And I'm trying to encourage her and trying to encourage her and say, look, this is not what it's about. It'll get better. And then last Sunday she said, Dad, Dad, the kids are here and it's a lot better. And then I get a phone call, and she says, we got all the kids together in chapel tonight, and we had prayer time. And six of those kids raised their hands and said that they'd never made a profession of faith. They'd never, they'd never accepted Christ. And then, and then on, uh, on, on, on Wednesday night, uh, Thursday morning before we left to go to Murray, she called us and she said, I got some exciting news. I said, what's that? And she said, I prayed with one of the campers tonight, last night, and he accepted Christ. And I said, that's it. You see, I said, that's why you're there. And, and see, that's example. Okay? Now, she, 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 she's drawn to that. And I didn't draw her to that. God drew her to that. But that's the example that we tried to set for her. That's what we wanted her to see us doing. And, and that's what we wanted her to be able to eventually do. You know, as you grow and as you raise them and as they go through that, you, you want them to get there. You do things for them to help them uh, to grow. Help them to mature. We were at a livestock show this past weekend, <laughs> and and uh, it was, it's always funny when we when we're working with animals and we're going and we're doing all these things. One of the things the kids tell us sometimes when the sweat's coming and it's hot and we're we're, we're wrestling and everything, and and this is where me and Michaela are at right now. It's like, Dad, this is not any fun, and I'm like, this is work. We work hard. We play hard. Okay, and that's what this is about. And so sometimes we have to set the example that there's times to work, and there's time to play. Uh, we have to be men of example, and we have to provide that Christian example. You know, one of the things that I, that I love uh, is Duck Dynasty. Um, I was reading some of Phil's biography, and, and I like that program. And one of the things that, that really uh, I love about it, and, you, and those of you that have seen it, is the very last uh, of every show, they all gather around the family dinner table, and they have a prayer. And here's the thing about being an example, and I, that's what I love about Phil is he's so simple. If you go back and you just listen to those prayers, you know, he is being a man of example for his family and now to a large portion of the viewers in the nation. But here's something about that. If you listen to his prayers, they're not some theological, life-changing, three-point sermon, poem, and a message, you know. It's just real simple. 
It's like, God, thank you for another good day here on planet Earth. And we thank you for this good food. And we sure thank you for this family. Amen. And let's eat. Listen, <laughs> it doesn't take a lot to be a man of example. You don't have to be Billy Graham. You don't have to have a, a four-point sermon for every prayer. But when you, you set the example to say, look, I'm, I'm going to be the spiritual leader of this house, and before we eat, we're going to pray, and, and we're going to thank God for what we have. Or maybe it's after the meal, or maybe it's before you leave for work in the morning. And you know, we try to do that every day uh, before we leave for school. When school's going on, mornings are really crazy, hectic, really nuts, and then things are going wild and we're trying to get out the door. But I always try to take 30 seconds before we leave and we just kind of get together and thank God for another day, for another opportunity, and for the blessings that we have. And those are not by far the most spiritual, deep uh, <laughs> prayers that I have, but we try to make that a priority in our house. We try to make that an example every day. We need to be men of example. Fourth thing, we need to be men seeking spiritual growth. Guys, don't send your wives to church with your kids. <laughs> Take them. Go with them. Be with them. It is so, so important. You need to be men seeking spiritual growth. Here's a, here's a, here's a, and I don't, I don't tell you this to frighten you, but this is just truth. And, 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 and also I will uh, just kind of tag this with, with, with God, all things are possible. Okay. Know that with God, all things are possible. But statistically, statistically, this is a Barna, a Barna piece. George Barna research says that once a child reaches the age of 20, the chances of them accepting Christ, if they haven't done so already, goes well below 10%. I think it's down around three to 5%. So know that. Know that. If you wait until they're grown, the chances of you being able to introduce them to Christ becomes very, very difficult. Now, if you have a child and you want don't give up. Okay? I always want to qualify that. God can do anything, but it gets really, really hard. Don't waste those days that you have when they're moldable and you can shape them and you can take them. You need to take them. And you need to be a man that's seeking spiritual growth. Finally, this morning, you need to be a man of hope. You need to be a man of hope. And what does that mean? You need to be a man who lives with the assurance of Christ. You need to be a man who lives with the hope of Christ in your heart, knowing that, that whatever happens to you, that that's where you're going to be, is that you're going to be in His presence. You need to live with that kind of hope. You know, we never know when something's going to happen. We never know when things are going to go a little bit crazy. Thursday afternoon, we were preparing to go to Murray uh, for a livestock show. And if you've ever taken seven or eight kids and a variety of animals on a two-hour road trip, it ain't easy, <laughs> okay? There's a lot of logistics you have to work out. There's a lot of reservations and health papers and all these kinds of things that you have to do and everything that comes along with it, and you're trying to get all these things done. So, so we're ready to go to Murray, and, and, uh, and Kelsey and Corey are here. They were on this trip, so they, they, can, they, can, uh, they can give you the full details later. But uh, Michaela was here, and, and, and so here's the thing. We're trying to get ready to go, and, and of course, you realize that when, if you've ever traveled with me, that there's, there's, uh, there's Eastern time, there's Central time, there's Mountain time, there's Pacific time, and there's Hillard time, okay? And Hillard time is a different time than anybody else has. And so I have the best intentions always, but, uh, you know, you never know what's going to happen. So last year it was really crazy late when we got there. So this year it's like, okay, we're going we're gonna to change things around. Everybody come to me. Bring all the animals to me. I'm going to have one trailer, one truck loaded, and then you guys bring everything here and we'll load the trailer and everything else. So we got one heifer, four sheep, two pigs that are making the original trip going to Murray. So it's not hard. We got a plenty of trailer for it. So we, I, I go to Eddie Golf, a friend of mine, borrow his three box trailer. This thing's 30 foot long and I got it on my truck. And I've never pulled that trailer with my truck before. So, so to start the whole process of loading up first, I pull into my driveway and I cut real hard to the left 
and, and Don probably knows what's coming next. I turn real hard to the left, and the next thing I hear an explosion in my cab of my truck, and my back glass is laying in my back seat, okay? Because you can do that with those, those long trailers like that. So that's where it started. So now we're vacuuming glass, and I get out my duct tape and my plastic and my cardboard boxes, and, you know, Jimmy Johnson would have been proud. I could patch a car up because that thing held, you know, going down the interstate and all the way back and, and the remnants of, of Tropical Storm Bill, and I didn't even get anything wet. So, so we patch up the, the cab, trying to get all the equipment, all the things that it takes. You got clippers, and you got blowers, and you got show stands, and shear stands, and feed for all the different species. And so all this stuff, we're trying to figure out and think through. Do we got this? Do we have this? You know, it's, it's, it's 10 times worse than any vacation you've ever been on. So we're trying to get everything loaded. Everything's in. Everything's going. And the last thing that we have to load are pigs, okay? Michaela's two pigs. Simple enough. We've got a small trailer with a ramp. The pigs like the trailer. They know the trailer. They're used to the trailer. It's not hard. So we're going to back the trailer into the barn and load the pigs up on the trailer. We did that. They're in the trailer. Everything's good. So we're ready to go. Everything's packed. Everything's ready. We're aimed toward Murray. We're headed west. Only thing I have left to do is back those two trailers together and move the pigs from one trailer to the next. Simple. It's a simple thing. It's so simple that everybody had such confidence it was going to work so easy that the guys left and headed on to Murray and left just me there with the little girls, okay? And I'm so confident that I go on in the house and change clothes and get off all my old sweaty packing clothes and put on some clean clothes and, and, and I put on my sandals, my traveling clothes, and I'm ready to drive, okay? So I come outside and say, okay, guys, we're just going to back these trailers together end to end. We're going to put the ramp inside of the box trailer and the pigs will just walk right in. It'll be great, okay? So we backed them into in. We put down the ramp. I get in and start moving the pig, and the pig's walking out. What's the pig's name? Toby, right? So Toby's walking along. Toby's walking along, and all of a sudden, his right hoof hits the floor of that aluminum trailer, and it slides, and Toby panicked. He went into a complete breakdown and the hog went nuts and he starts squealing and flipping and twisting and he jumps out of the trailer into the grass and the other pig comes with him and so now we got two pigs in the yard two trailers back together three girls and me trying to figure out how in the world we're gonna get these pigs back up okay so this begins the next hour and a half and the dew point 70 and the humidity is 150 percent and i start sweating again and so we back them up and we get them in there and we get them back in the other trailer and i'm trying to push toby and toby ain't wanting none of it and we keep going and we keep going and it's just time after time after time and i'm pushing this hog and i'm pushing this hog and if you've never pushed a 130 pound hog somewhere that he doesn't want to go it's not easy, okay? And, and it's not only physical, but it becomes psychological because I'm a dad and I don't like kids crying and this hog is screaming and he's having a fit and he's squealing and squealing and squealing and I'm twisting his ear and his tail and we're trying to get him going. And, and, and after all of this is going on and going on and going on and going on, I've, I'm exhausted. I'm completely exhausted. It's like a runner coming to the finish line and I just kind of, I didn't pass out, but I just kind of fell on the trailer. Boom! All 200 plus pounds of me in the floor in the pig poop and in the pine shavings, and I'm just laid out. Well, they were convinced that I died. They were convinced that I had a heart attack and died in the trailer with the hog. And, and Kayla is freaking out. She's like, ah! and, I could just, and I could see, I couldn't really communicate because I was completely exhausted. The pig just ran back on his little safe trailer, and he was back over here, and I'm laying there on the floor going, ah! and I'm trying to say, I'm okay, I'm okay, and she's convinced that I've died. And so finally I get up, and I go in and I sit down. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. It, 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 I saw the fear in Kayla's eyes. And that's something that really affected me. And, and, and so that I wanted her, and, and I wanted to make sure. And I, and I hope that she knows. And I hope that all of our kids know that I'm a man of hope. And, and if something happens like that, and all of a sudden I'm here one second, and the next second I'm gone, that I'm okay. All right? And that I will spend all eternity in heaven with my heavenly father and and then even though something that and for some of you all that may be the case that may be what has happened and i pray and i hope that your father was a man of hope and that you have that hope and that assurance and knowing that one day you will be with them forever 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 and if you're here this morning and you don't have that hope don't leave here without it now, for the benefit of those watching online and for Josh, he said, you never did tell us the rest of the story. What happened? Well, we were putting the lights on the pig, 
Okay, so what they did is they turned the lights around and they shined them on me and one on the grill. And then the pig knew who he was dealing with. Okay, there's many pigs. Many pigs have been across that grill. And he had a moment of panic and he ran on the trailer. No, actually not. Good friends showed up with lots more muscle and lots more power and lots more, and we finally got him calmed down and we got him on the trailer. And so a moment of panic and a moment of fear turned into a decent trip to Murray and everything was fine. But here's the thing. If you've ever had that moment of fear, if you ever had that moment, because it, it, was, it was one of those moments that uh, will affect Michaela for a long time, I know. Uh, if you ever had that place, had that time where it's like, uh, I, I'm afraid I'm going to lose somebody and I don't know. Don't, don't leave here without that knowledge. Don't leave here this morning without that hope. And guys, it's the greatest gift that you can give to your kids. The greatest gift that you can give to your kids is to be a man of God. To be a man that trusts Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And not afraid and not ashamed to admit that. Not afraid to explain who that is to them. And not afraid to teach them about Him all the days of their life. And one day they will come and they will ask and they will want to put their trust and their hope in the same Savior that you have. If you're here this morning and you've never made that decision, don't leave here without doing it. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you. We thank you for an opportunity to share your word. Father, help us to choose the right way. As, uh, as you laid out for us in that first psalm so many years ago, exactly what uh, it is to be a man of character, to be a man of integrity, to be a man of example, to, me, to be a man seeking spiritual growth, and to be a man of hope. To be a man who has put their trust and their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And no matter what happens, no matter what accident, no matter what moment, no matter what instance happens, once we've made that decision to trust Christ as our Lord and Savior, nothing takes that away from us. Father, I am so blessed. This church is so blessed with its leadership. This church is so blessed with the men that lead this church. Father, we just pray for the, for the men of this church. And I, I pray for all of our members. And Father, maybe there's someone here this morning. Maybe there's someone here this morning that's never put their trust and their faith in Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, I just pray now. I just pray now that whatever, whatever decision we need to make and whatever we need to do, I pray that we'll make that decision this morning. Father, you know where we are. You know where our hearts are. Stir our hearts within us the power of the Holy Spirit and lead us, Father. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name.